One, Loomings. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. There now is your insular city of the Manhattos, belted round by wharves, as Indian isles by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left the streets take you waterward. Its extreme downtown is the battery, where that noble mole is washed by waves and cooled by breezes, which a few hours previous were out of sight of land. Look at the crowds of water-gazers there. Circumambulate the city of a dreamy Sabbath afternoon. Go from Corlier's Hook to Conti's Slip, and from thence by Whitehall northward. What do you see? Posted like silent sentinels all around the town, stand thousands upon thousands of mortal men fixed in ocean reveries. Some leaning against the spiles, some seated upon the pierheads, some looking over the bulwarks of ships from China, some high aloft in the rigging, as if striving to get a still better seaward peep. But these are all landsmen, of weekdays pent up in lath and plaster, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? What do they here? But look, here come more crowds, pacing straight for the water, and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange! Nothing will content them but the extremest limit of the land. Loitering under the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No, they must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues. Inlanders all, they come from lanes and alleys, streets and avenues, north, east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, does the magnetic virtue of the needles of the compasses of all those ships attract them thither? Once more, say you are in the country, in some high land of lakes. Take almost any path you please, and ten to one it carries you down in a dale and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged in his deepest reveries, stand that man on his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead you to water, if water there be in all that region. Should you ever be athirst in the great American desert, try this experiment, if your caravan happen to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded for ever. But here is the artist. He desires to paint you the dreamiest, shadiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of romantic landscape in all the valley of Asako. What is the chief element he employs? There stand his trees, each with a hollow trunk, as if a hermit and a crucifix were within. And here sleeps his meadow, and there sleep his cattle, and up from yonder cottage goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into the distant woodlands winds a mazy way, reaching to overlapping spurs of mountains bathed in their hillside blue. But though the picture lies thus tranced, and though this pine tree shakes down its sighs like leaves upon the shepherd's head, yet all were vain unless the shepherd's eye were fixed upon the magic stream before him. 
Go visit the prairies in June, when for scores on scores of miles you wade knee-deep among tiger lilies. What is the one charm wanting? Water. There is not a drop of water there. Were Niagara but a cataract of sand, would you travel your thousand miles to see it? Why did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly receiving two handfuls of silver, deliberate whether to buy him a coat, which he sadly needed, or invest the money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach? Why is almost every robust healthy boy with a robust healthy soul in him at some time or other crazy to go to sea? Why, upon your first voyage as a passenger, did you f yourself feel such a mystical vibration when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity and own brother of Jove? Surely all of this is not without meaning." and still deeper the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who, because he could not grasp the tormenting mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life, and this is the key to it all. Now when I say I am in the habit of going to sea whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to be over-conscious of my lungs, I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger. For to go as a passenger you must needs have a purse, and a purse is but a rag unless you have something in it. Besides, passengers get seasick, grow quarrelsome, don't sleep of nights, do not enjoy themselves much as a general thing. No, I never go as a passenger, nor, though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to sea as a commodore or a captain or a cook. I abandon the glory and distinction of such offices to those who like them. For my part, I abominate all honorable, respectable toils, trials, and tribulations of every kind, whatever. It is quite as much as I can do to take care of myself without taking care of ships, barks, brigs, schooners, and what not. And as for going as cook, though I confess there is considerable glory in that, a cook being a sort of officer on shipboard, yet somehow I never fancied broiling fowls, though once broiled, judiciously buttered, and judgmatically salted and peppered, there is no one who will speak more respectfully, not to say reverently, of a broiled fowl than I will. It is out of the idolatrous dotings of the old Egyptians upon broiled ibis and roasted river horse that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge bakehouses, the pyramids. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor, right before the mast, plumb down into the forecastle, aloft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some, and make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a May meadow, and at first this sort of thing is unpleasant enough. It touches one's sense of honor, particularly if you come of an old established family in the land, the Van Rensselaers or Randolphs or Hardicanutes, and more than all, if just previous to putting your hand into the tar-pot, you have been lording it as a country schoolmaster, making the tallest boys stand in awe of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from a schoolmaster to a sailor, and requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. But even this wears off in time. What of it if some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to get a broom and sweep down the decks? What does that indignity amount to, weighed, I mean, in these scales of the New Testament? Do you think the archangel Gabriel thinks anything the less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey that old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well then, however the old sea captains may order me about— however they may thump and punch me about, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it is all right, that everybody else is in one way or other served in much the same way, either in a physical or metaphysical point of view, that is. And so the universal thump is passed round, and all hands should rub each other's shoulder-blades, 
and be content. Again, I always go to sea as a sailor because they make a point of paying me for my trouble, whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. On the contrary, passengers themselves must pay. And there is all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. The act of paying is perhaps the most uncomfortable infliction that the two orchard thieves entailed upon us. But being paid, what will compare with it? The urbane activity with which a man receives money is really marvellous, considering that we so earnestly believe money to be the root of all earthly ills, and that on no account can a moneyed man enter heaven. Ah, how cheerfully we consign ourselves to perdition! Finally, I always go to see a sailor because of the wholesome exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck. For, as in this world, headwinds are far more prevalent than winds from astern, that is, if you never violate the Pythagorean maxim, so, for the most part, the commodore on the quarter-deck gets his atmosphere at second-hand from the sailors on the forecastle. He thinks he breathes at first, but not so. In much the same way do the commonality lead their leaders in many other things, at the same time that the leaders little suspect it, but wherefore it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor I should now take it into my head to go on a whaling voyage, this the invisible police officer of the fates, who has the constant surveillance of me and secretly dogs me and influences me in some unaccountable way, he can better answer than any one else. And doubtless my going on this whaling voyage formed part of the grand program of Providence that was drawn up a long time ago. It came as a sort of brief interlude and solo between more extensive performances. I take it that this part of the bill must have run something like this. Grand contested election for the presidency of the United States. Whaling voyage by one Ishmael. Bloody battle in Afghanistan. Though I cannot tell why it was exactly that those stage managers, the fates, put me down for this shabby part of a whaling voyage, when others were set down for magnificent parts in high tragedies, and short and easy parts in genteel comedies, and jolly parts in farces, though I cannot tell why this was exactly, yet now that I recall all the circumstances, I think I can see a little into the springs and motives which, being cunningly presented to me under various disguises, induced me to set about performing the part I did, besides cajoling me into the delusion that it was a choice resulting from my own unbiased free will and discriminating judgment. Chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself, such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. Then the wild and distant seas where he rolled his island bulk, the undeliverable, the nameless perils of the whale, these with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds helped sway me to my wish. With other men, perhaps, such things would not have been inducements, but as for me... I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. Not ignoring what is good, I am quick to perceive a horror, and could still be social with it, would they let me, since it is but well to be on friendly terms with all the inmates of the place one lodges in. By reason of these things, then, the whaling voyage was welcome, the great floodgates of the wonder-world swung open, and into the wild conceits that swayed me to my purpose, two and two there floated into my inmost soul endless processions of the whale, and midmost of them all, one grand hooded phantom, like a snow hill in the air. Chapter 2. The Carpet Bag I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started for Cape Horn in the Pacific. Quitting the good city of old Manhattan, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that no way of reaching that place would offer till the following Monday. 
As most candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at this same New Bedford thence to embark on their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of so doing. For my mind was made up to sail in no other than a Nantucket craft, because there was a fine boisterous something about everything connected with that famous old island which amazingly pleased me. Besides, though New Bedford has of late been gradually monopolizing the business of whaling, and though in this matter poor old Nantucket is now much behind her, yet Nantucket was her great original, the tire of this Carthage, the place where the first dead American whale was stranded. Where else but from Nantucket did those aboriginal whalemen, the red men, first sally out in canoes to give chase to the Leviathan, and where but from Nantucket, too, did that first adventurous little sloop put forth, partly laden with imported cobblestones, so goes the story, to throw at the whales, in order to discover when they were nigh enough to risk a harpoon from the bowsprit. Now, having a night, a day, and still another night following before me in New Bedford, ere I could embark for my destined port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. It was a very dubious-looking, nay, a very dark and dismal night, bitingly cold and cheerless. I knew no one in the place. With anxious grapnels I had sounded my pocket, and only brought up a few pieces of silver. So wherever you go, Ishmael, said I to myself, as I stood in the middle of a dreary street shouldering my bag, and comparing the gloom toward the north with the darkness towards the south. Wherever in your wisdom you may conclude to lodge for the night, my dear Ishmael, be sure to inquire the price, and don't be too particular. With halting steps I paced the streets, and passed the sign of the Cross Tarpoons, but it looked too expensive and jolly there. Further on, from the bright red windows of the Swordfish Inn, there came such fervent rays that it seemed to have melted the packed snow and ice before the house, for everywhere else the congealed frost lay ten inches thick in a hard asphaltic pavement. Rather weary for me when I struck my foot against the flinty projections, because from hard, remorseless service the soles of my boots were in a most miserable plight. Too expensive and jolly, again, thought I, pausing one moment to watch the broad glare in the street and hear the sounds of the tinkling glasses within. But go on, Ishmael, said I at last, don't you hear? Get away from before the door, your patched boots are stopping the way. So on I went. I now, by instinct, followed the streets that took me waterward, for there, doubtless, were the cheapest, if not the cheeriest, inns. Such dreary streets! Blocks of blackness, not houses, on either hand, and here and there a candle, like a candle moving about in a tomb. At this hour of the night, of the last day of the week, that quarter of the town proved all but deserted. But presently I came to a smoky light proceeding from a low, wide building, the door of which stood invitingly open. It had a careless look, as if it were meant for the uses of the public, so entering the first thing I did was to stumble over an ash-box in the porch. Ha! thought I, ha! as the flying particles almost choked me, are these ashes from that destroyed city, Gamora? But the crossed harpoons and the swordfish? This, then, must needs be the sign of the trap. However, I picked myself up, and hearing a loud voice within, pushed on and opened a second interior door. It seemed a great black parliament sitting in Tophet. A hundred black faces turned round in their rows to peer, and beyond a black angel of doom was beating a book in the pulpit. It was a negro church, and the preacher's text was about the blackness of darkness, and the weeping and wailing and teeth-gnashing there. Ha! Ishmael, muttered I, backing out, wretched entertainment at the sign of the trap. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light, not far from the docks, and heard a forlorn creaking in the air, and, looking up, saw a swinging sign over the door with a white painting on it, faintly representing a tall, straight jet of misty spray, and these words underneath, The Spouter Inn, Peter Coffin. Coffin? 
spouter. Rather ominous in that particular connection, thought I. But it is a common name in Nantucket, they say, and I suppose this Peter here is an emigrant from there. As the light looked so dim, and the place for the time looked quiet enough, and the dilapidated little wooden house itself looked as if it might have been carted here from the ruins of some burnt district, and as the swinging sign had a poverty-stricken sort of creak to it, I thought that here was the very spot for cheap lodgings and the best of pea coffee. It was a queer sort of place, a gable-ended old house, one side palsied, as it were, and leaning over sadly. It stood on a sharp, bleak corner, where that tempestuous wind Euroclodon kept up a worse howling than ever it did about poor Paul's tossed craft. Euroclodon, nevertheless, is a mighty pleasant zephyr to any one indoors, with his feet on the hob quietly toasting for bed. In judging of that tempestuous wind called Euroclodon, says an old writer, of whose works I possess the only copy extant, it maketh a marvellous difference whether thou lookest out at it from a glass window where the frost is all on the outside, or whether thou observest it from that sashless window where the frost is on both sides, and of which the white death is the only glazier. True enough, thought I, as this passage occurred to my mind, old black letter, thou reasonest well. Yes, these eyes are windows, and this body of mine is the house. What a pity they didn't stop up the chinks and the crannies, though, and thrust in a little lint here and there. But it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished, the copestone is on, and the chips were carted off a million years ago. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his pillow, and shaking off his tatters with his shiverings, he might plug up both ears with rags and put a corn cob in his mouth, and yet that would not keep out the tempestuous Euroclodon. Euroclodon, says old Dives in his red silken wrapper. He had a redder one afterwards. Pooh, pooh, what a fine frosty night! How Orion glitters! What northern lights! Let them talk of their oriental summer climes of everlasting conservatories. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by holding them up to the grand northern lights? Would not Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far rather lay him down lengthwise along the line of the equator? Yeah, ye gods! Go down to the fiery pit itself in order to keep out this frost? Now that Lazarus should lie stranded there on the curbstone before the door of Dives, this is more wonderful than that an iceberg should be moored to one of the Maluccas. Yet Dives himself, he too lives like a czar in an ice palace made of frozen size, and being president of a temperance society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. But no more of this blubbering now, we are going a-wailing, and there is plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet, and see what sort of a place this spouter may be. End of chapters 1 and 2 Entering that gable-ended spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, straggling entry with old-fashioned wainscots, reminding one of the bulwarks of some condemned old craft. On one side hung a very large oil painting, so thoroughly besmoked and every way defaced that, in the unequal cross-lights by which you viewed it, it was only by diligent study and a series of systematic visits to it and careful inquiry of the neighbors that you could any way arrive at an understanding of its purpose. Such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows, that at first you almost thought some ambitious young artist, in the time of the New England hags, had endeavored to delineate chaos bewitched. But by dint of much an earnest contemplation and oft-repeated ponderings, and especially by throwing open the little window towards the back of the entry, you might at last come to the conclusion that such an idea, however wild, might not be altogether unwarranted. But what most puzzled and confounded you was a long, limber, portentous black mass of something hovering at the centre of the picture, 
over three blue, dim, perpendicular lines floating in a nameless yeast. A boggy, soggy, squitchy picture, truly, enough to uh, drive a nervous man distracted. Yet was there a sort of indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity about it that fairly froze you to it, till you involuntarily took an oath with yourself to find out what that marvellous painting meant. Ever and anon a bright but, alas, deceptive idea would dart you through. It's the black sea in a midnight gale. It's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements. It's a blasted heath. It's a hyperborean winter scene. It's the breaking up of the ice-bound stream of time. But at last all these fancies yielded to that one portentous something in the picture's midst. That once found out, and all the rest were plain. But stop. Does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic fish? even the great leviathan himself? In fact, the artist's design seemed this, a final theory of my own, partly based upon the aggregated opinions of many aged persons with whom I conversed upon the subject. The picture represents a Cape Horner in a great hurricane, the half-foundered ship weltering there with its three dismantled masts alone visible, and an exasperated whale, purposing to spring clean over the craft, is in the enormous act of impaling himself upon the three mastheads. The opposite wall of this entry was hung over with a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears. Some were thickly set with glittering teeth resembling ivory saws, others were tufted with knots of human hair, and one was sickle-shaped, with a vast handle sweeping round like the segment made in the new-mown grass by a long-armed mower. You shuddered as you gazed, and wondered what monstrous cannibal and savage could ever have gone a death-harvesting with such a hacking, horrifying implement. Mixed with these were rusty old whaling lances and harpoons all broken and deformed. Some were storied weapons. With this once long last, now wildly elbowed, fifty years ago did Nathan Swain kill fifteen whales between a sunrise and a sunset, and that harpoon, so like a corkscrew now, was flung in the Javan seas and run away with by a whale years afterwards slain off the Cape of Blanco. The original iron entered nigh the tail, and, like a restless needle sojourning in the body of a man, travelled full forty feet and at last was found embedded in the hump. Crossing this dusky entry, and on through yon low-arched way, cut through what in old times must have been a great central chimney with fireplaces all round, you enter the public room. A still duskier place as this, with such low ponderous beams above, and such old wrinkled planks beneath, that you would almost fancy you trod some old craft's cockpits, especially of such a howling night when this corner-anchored old ark rocked so furiously. On one side stood a long, low, shelf-like table covered with cracked glass cases, filled with dusty rarities gathered from this wide world's remotest nooks. Projecting from the further angle of the room stands a dark-looking den, the bar, a rude attempt at a right whale's head. Be that how it may, there stands the vast arched bone of the whale's jaw, so wide a coach might almost drive beneath it. Within are shabby shelves, ranged round with old decanters, bottles, flasks, and in those jaws of swift destruction, like another cursed Jonah, by which name indeed they called him, bustles a little withered old man, who, for their money, dearly sells the sailor's deliriums and death. Abominable are the tumblers into which he pours his poison. Though true cylinders without, within the villainous green goggling glasses deceitfully tapered downwards to a cheating bottom, parallel meridians rudely pecked into the glass surround these footpads' goblets. Fill to this mark, and your charge is but a penny, to this a penny more, and so on to the full glass, the Cape Horn measure which you may gulp down for a shilling." Upon entering the place I found a number of young seamen gathered about a table, examining by a dim light the diverse specimens of scrimshander. I sought the landlord, and, telling him I desired to be accommodated with a room, received for answer that his house was full, not a bed unoccupied. "'But avast,' he added, tapping his forehead, 
You hain't no objections to sharing a hoppinier's blanket, have you? I suppose you're going a whaling, so you better get used to that sort of thing. I told him that I never liked to sleep two in a bed, that if I should ever do so it would depend upon who the harpineer might be, and that if he, the landlord, really had no other place for me, and the harpooner was not decidedly objectionable, why, rather than wander further about a strange town on so bitter a night, I would put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. I thought so. All right, take a seat. Supper? You want supper? Supper'll be ready directly. I sat down on an old wooden settle, carved all over like a bench on the battery, at one end, a ruminating tar was still further adorning it with his jackknife, stooping over and diligently working away at the space between his legs. He was trying his hand at a ship under full sail, but he didn't make much headway, I thought. At last, some four or five of us were summoned to our meal in an adjoining room. It was cold as Iceland, no fire at all. The landlord said he couldn't afford it. Nothing but two dismal tallow candles, each in a winding sheet. We were fain to button up our monkey jackets and hold to our lips cups of scalding tea with our half frozen fingers. But the fare was of the most substantial kind not only meat and potatoes, but dumplings, good heavens, dumplings for supper. One young fellow in a green box coat addressed himself to these dumplings in a most direful manner. "'My boy,' said the landlord, "'you'll have the nightmare to a dead certainty.' "'Landlord,' I whispered, "'that ain't the harpooner, is it?' "'Oh, no,' said he, looking sort of diabolically funny. "'The harpooner is a dark-complexioned chap. "'He never eats dumplings, he don't. "'He eats nothing but steaks, and he likes em rare.' "'The devil he does,' says I. "'Where is that harpooner? Is he here?' "'He'll be here for long,' was the answer. I could not help it, but I began to feel suspicious of this dark-complexioned harpooner. At any rate, I made up my mind that if it so turned out that we should sleep together, he must undress and get into bed before I did. Supper over, the company went back to the bar-room, when, knowing not what else to do with myself, I resolved to spend the rest of the evening as a looker-on. Presently a rioting noise was heard without. Starting up, the landlord cried, "'That's the Grampus's crew. I seed her reported in the offing this morning. A three years' voyage and a full ship. Hurrah, boys! Now we'll have the latest news from the Fijis.' A tramping of sea-boots was heard in the entry. The door was flung open, and in rolled a wild set of mariners enough. Enveloped in their shaggy watch-coats, and with their heads muffled in woollen comforters, all bedarned and ragged, and their beards stiff with icicles, they seemed an eruption of bears from Labrador. They had just landed from their boat, and this was the first house they entered. No wonder, then, that they made a straight wake for the whale's mouth, the bar, when the wrinkled little old Jonah, there officiating, soon poured them out brimmers all round. One complained of a bad cold in his head, upon which Jonah mixed him a pitch-like potion of gin and molasses, which he swore was a sovereign cure for all colds and catters whatever, never mind of how long-standing, or whether caught off the coast of Labrador or on the weather side of an ice island. The liquor soon mounted into their heads, as it generally does even with the errantest toppers newly landed from sea, and they began capering about most obstreperously. I observed, however, that one of them held somewhat aloof, and though he seemed desirous not to spoil the hilarity of his shipmates by his own sober face, yet upon the whole he refrained from making as much noise as the rest. This man interested me at once, and since the sea-gods had ordained that he should soon be my shipmate, though but a sleeping partner one so far as this narrative is concerned, I will here venture upon a little description of him. He stood a full six feet in height, with noble shoulders, and a chest like a coffer-dam. I have seldom seen such brawn in a man. His face was deeply brown and burnt, making his white teeth dazzling by the contrast, while in the deep shadows of his eyes floated some reminiscences that did not seem to give him much joy. His voice at once announced that he was a southerner, and from his fine stature I thought he must be one of those tall mountaineers from the Alleghanian Ridge in Virginia. 
When the revelry of his companions had mounted to its height, this man slipped away unobserved, and I saw no more of him till he became my comrade on the sea. In a few minutes, however, he was missed by his shipmates, and being, it seems, for some reason a huge favorite with them, they raised a cry of, Bulkington! Bulkington! Where's Bulkington? and darted out of the house in pursuit of him. It was now about nine o'clock, and the room seeming almost supernaturally quiet after these orgies, I began to congratulate myself upon a little plan that had occurred to me just previous to the entrance of the seaman. No man prefers to sleep too in a bed. In fact, you would a good deal rather not sleep with your own brother. I don't know how it is, but people like to be private when they are sleeping and when it comes to sleeping with an unknown stranger in a strange inn in a strange town, and that stranger a harpooner, then your objections indefinitely multiply. Nor was there any earthly reason why I, as a sailor, should sleep too in a bed more than anybody else, for sailors no more sleep too in a bed at sea than bachelor kings do ashore. To be sure, they all sleep together in one apartment, but you have your own hammock, and cover yourself with your own blanket, and sleep in your own skin. The more I pondered over this harpooner, the more I abominated the thought of sleeping with him. It was fair to presume that being a harpooner, his linen, or woolen, as the case might be, would not be of the tidiest, certainly none of the finest. I began to twitch all over. Besides, it was getting late, and my decent harpooner ought to be home and going bedwards. Suppose now he should tumble in upon me at midnight. How could I tell from what vile hole he had been coming? Landlord, I've changed my mind about that harpooner. I shan't sleep with him. I'll try the bench here. Just as you please. I'm sorry I can't spare you a tablecloth for the mattress. And it's a plaguey rough board here. Feeling of the knots and notches. But wait a bit, Scrimshander. I've got a carpenter's plane there in the bar. Wait, I say, and I'll make you snug enough. So saying, he procured the plane, and with his old silk handkerchief first dusting the bench, vigorously set to planing away at my bed, the while grinning like an ape. The shavings flew right and left, till at last the plane iron came bump against an indestructible knot. The landlord was near spraining his wrist, and I told him for heaven's sake to quit. The bed was soft enough to suit me, and I did not know how all the planing in the world could make eider down of a pine plank. So, gathering up the shavings with another grin, and throwing them into the great stove in the middle of the room, he went about his business, and left me in a brown study. I now took the measure of the bench, and found that it was a foot too short, but that could be mended with a chair. But it was a foot too narrow, and the other bench in the room was about four inches higher than the planed one so there was no yoking them. I then placed the first bench lengthwise along the only clear space against the wall, leaving a little interval between for my back to settle down in. But I soon found that there came such a draught of cold air over me from under the sill of the window that this plan would never do at all, especially as another current from the rickety door met the one from the window, and both together formed a series of small whirlwinds in the immediate vicinity of the spot where I had thought to spend the night. The devil fetch that harpooner, thought I. But stop. Couldn't I steal a march on him? Bolt his door inside and jump into his bed, not to be wakened by the most violent knockings? It seemed no bad idea, but upon second thoughts I dismissed it. For who could tell but what the next morning, so soon as I popped out of the room, the harpooner might be standing in the entry, all ready to knock me down. Still, looking round me again, and seeing no possible chance of spending a sufferable night unless in some other person's bed, I began to think that, after all, I might be cherishing unwarrantable prejudices against this unknown harpooner. Thinks I, I'll wait a while. He must be dropping in before long. I'll have a good look at him then, and perhaps we may become jolly good bedfellows after all. There's no telling." But though the other boarders kept coming in by ones, twos, and threes, and going to bed, yet no sign of my harpooner. Landlord, said I, what sort of chap is he? Does he always keep such late hours? It was now hard upon twelve o'clock. The landlord chuckled again with his lean chuckle, and seemed to be mightily tickled at something beyond my comprehension. 
No, he answered. Generally he's an early bird, early to bed and early to rise. Yes, he's the bird what catches the worm. But tonight he went out a peddling, you see, and I don't see what on earth keeps him so late unless maybe he can't sell his head. Can't sell his head? What sort of a bamboozlingly story is this you're telling me? Getting into a towering rage. Do you pretend to say, landlord, that this harpooner is actually engaged this blessed Saturday night, or rather Sunday morning, in peddling his head around town? That's precisely it, said the landlord, and I told him he couldn't sell it here, the market's overstocked. With what, shouted I? With heads, to be sure. Ain't there too many heads in the world? I tell you what it is, landlord, I said quite calmly. "'You'd better stop spinning that yarn to me. I am not green.' And "'Maybe not,' taking a stick out and whittling a toothpick. "'But I rather guess you'll be done brown if that air harpooner hears you a slander in his head.' "'I'll break it for him,' said I, now flying into a passion against this unaccountable farrago of the landlord's. "'It's broke already,' said he. "'Broke,' said I. "'Broke, do you mean?' "'Certain, and that's the very reason he can't sell it, I guess.' "'Landlord,' said I, going up to him as cool as Mount Hecla in a snowstorm, "'Landlord, stop whittling. "'You and I must understand one another, and that too without delay. "'I come to your house and want a bed. "'You tell me you can only give me half of one, "'that the other half belongs to a certain harpooner.' and about this harpooner, whom I have not yet seen, you persist in telling me the most mystifying and exasperating stories, tending to beget in me an uncomfortable feeling towards the man whom you design for my bedfellow. A sort of connection, landlord, which is an intimate and confidential one in the highest degree. I now demand of you to speak out and tell me who and what this harpooner is, and whether I shall be in all respects safe to spend the night with him and in the first place you will be so good as to unsay that story about selling his head, which, if true, I take to be good evidence that this harpooner is stark mad, and I've no idea of sleeping with a madman. And you, sir, you, I mean, landlord, you, sir, by trying to induce me to do so knowingly would thereby render yourself liable to a criminal prosecution." "'Well,' said the landlord, fetching a long breath, "'that's a pretty long sermon for a chap that rips a little now and then. "'But be easy, be easy. "'This here harpooner I've been telling you of "'has just arrived from the South Seas, "'where he bought up a lot of bomb New Zealand heads, "'great curios, you know, "'and he sold all of them but one, "'and that one he's trying to sell tonight, "'cause tomorrow's Sunday, "'and it would not do to be selling human heads "'about the streets when folks is going to churches. "'He wanted to last Sunday, "'but I stopped him just as he was going out the door "'with four heads strung on a string, "'for all the earth like a string of onions.' "'This account cleared up the otherwise unaccountable mystery "'and showed that the landlord, after all, "'had no idea of fooling me.' But at the same time, what could I think of a harpooner who stayed out of a Saturday night clean into the Holy Sabbath, engaged in such a cannibal business as selling the heads of dead idolaters? Depend upon it, landlord, that harpooner is a dangerous man. He pays, regular, was the rejoinder. But come, it's getting dreadful late. You'd better be turning flukes. It's a nice bed. Sal and me slept in that air bed the night we was spliced. There's plenty of room for two to kick about in that bed. It's an almighty big bed, that. Why, afore we give it up, Sal used to put our Sam and little Johnny in the foot of it. But I got a-dreamin' and sprawlin' about one night, and somehow Sam got pitched on the floor, and came near breakin' his arm. After that, Sal said it wouldn't do. Come along here, I'll give you a glim in a jiffy. And so saying, he lighted a candle and held it towards me, offering to lead the way but I stood irresolute. When looking at a clock in the corner, he exclaimed, "'I vomit Sunday. You won't see that harpooner to-night. He's come to anchor somewhere. Come along, then. Do come, won't you come?' I considered the matter a moment, and then upstairs we went, and I was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam, and furnished, sure enough, with a prodigious bed, almost big enough, indeed, for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. 
There, said the landlord, placing the candle on a crazy old sea chest that did double duty as a washstand and center table. There, make yourself comfortable now, and good night to you. I turned round from eyeing the bed, but he had disappeared. Folding back the counterpane, I stood over the bed. Though none of the most elegant, it yet stood the scrutiny tolerable well. I then glanced round the room, and besides the bedstead and centre-table could see no other furniture belonging to the place, but a rude shelf, the four walls, and a papered fireboard representing a man striking a whale. Of things not properly belonging to the room, there was a hammock lashed up and thrown upon the floor in one corner, also a large seaman's bag containing the harpooner's wardrobe, no doubt in lieu of a land trunk. Likewise there was a parcel of outlandish bone fish-hooks on the shelf over the fireplace, and a tall harpoon standing at the head of the bed. But what is this on the chest? I took it up, and held it close to the light, and felt it, and smelt it, and tried every way possible to arrive at some satisfactory conclusion concerning it. I can compare it to nothing but a large doormat, ornamented at the edges with little tinkling tags, something like the stained porcupine quills round an Indian moccasin. There was a hole or slit in the middle of this mat, as you see the same in South American ponchos. But could it be possible that any sober harpooner could get into a doormat and parade the streets of any Christian town in that sort of guise? I put it on to try it, and it weighed me down like a hamper, being uncommonly shaggy and thick, and I thought a little damp, as though this mysterious harpooner had been wearing it of a rainy day. I went up to it in a bit of glass stuck against the wall, and I never saw such a sight in my life. I tore myself out of it in such a hurry that I gave myself a kink in the neck. I sat down on the side of the bed and commenced thinking about this head-peddling harpooner and his doormat. After thinking some time on the bedside, I got up and took off my monkey jacket, and then stood in the middle of the room thinking. Then I took off my coat and thought a little more in my shirt-sleeves. But beginning to feel very cold now, half undressed as I was, and remembering what the landlord said about the harpooners not coming home at all that night, it being so very late, I made no more ado, but jumped out of my pantaloons and boots, and then, blowing out the light, tumbled into bed, and commended myself to the care of heaven. Whether that mattress was stuffed with corn-cobs or broken crockery, there is no telling, but I rolled about a good deal, and could not sleep for a long time. At last I slid off into a light doze, and had pretty nearly made a good offing towards the land of Nod, when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage, and saw a glimmer of light come into the room from under the door. Lord, save me, thinks I, that must be the harpooner, the infernal head peddler. But I lay perfectly still and resolved not to say a word till spoken to. Holding a light in one hand, and that identical New Zealand head in the other, the stranger entered the room, and without looking towards the bed, placed his candle a good way off from me on the floor in one corner, and then began working away at the knotted cords of the large bag I before spoke of as being in the room, I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing the bag's mouth. This accomplished, however, he turned round, when, good heavens, what a sight! Such a face! It was of a dark purplish-yellow color, here and there stuck over with large blackish-looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought, he's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and here he is just from the surgeon." but at that moment he chanced to turn his face so towards the light that I plainly saw they could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his cheeks. They were stains of some sort or other. At first I knew not what to make of this, but soon an inkling of the truth occurred to me. I remembered a story of a white man, a whaleman too, who, falling among the cannibals, had been tattooed by them. I concluded that this harpooner in the course of his distant voyages must have met with a similar adventure. And what is it, thought I, after all? It's only his outside. A man can be honest in any sort of skin. But then, what to make of his unearthly complexion? That part of it, I mean, lying round about and completely independent of the squares of tattooing. To be sure, it might be nothing but a good coat of tropical tanning, but I never heard of a hot sun tanning a white man into a purplish-yellow one. 
However, I had never been in the South Seas, and perhaps the sun there produced these extraordinary effects upon the skin. Now, while all these ideas were passing through me like lightning, this harpooner never noticed me at all. But after some difficulty, having opened his bag, he commenced fumbling in it, and presently pulled out a sort of a tomahawk, and a seal-skin wallet with the hair on. Putting these on the old chest in the middle of the room, he then took the New Zealand head, a ghastly thing enough, and crammed it down into the bag. He now took off his hat, a new beaver hat, when I came nigh singing out with fresh surprise. There was no hair on his head, none to speak of at least, nothing but a small scalp knot twisted upon his forehead. His bald purplish head now looked for all the world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker than I ever bolted a dinner. Even as it was, I thought something of slipping out the window, but it was the second floor back. I am no coward, but what to make of this head-peddling purple rascal altogether passed my comprehension. Ignorance is the parent of fear, and being completely nonplussed and confounded about the stranger, I confessed I was now as much afraid of him as if it was the devil himself who had thus broken into my room in the dead of night. In fact, I was so afraid of him that I was not game enough just then to address him, and demand a satisfactory answer concerning what seemed inexplicable in him. Meanwhile he continued the business of undressing, and at last showed his chest and arms. As I live, these covered parts of him were checkered with the same squares as his face. His back, too, was all over the same dark squares, he seemed to have been in a thirty years' war, and just escaped from it with a sticking-plaster shirt. Still more, his very legs were marked as if a parcel of dark green frogs were running up the trunks of young palms. It was now quite plain that he must be some abominable savage or other shipped aboard of a whaleman in the South Seas, and so landed in this Christian country. I quaked to think of it. A peddler of heads, too. Perhaps the heads of his own brothers— he might take a fancy to mine. Heavens, look at that tomahawk! But there was no time for shuddering, for now the savage went about something that completely fascinated my attention, and convinced me that he must indeed be a heathen. Going to his heavy grego, or rapal, or dreadnought, which he had previously hung on a chair, he fumbled in the pockets, and produced at length a curious little deformed image, with a hunch on its back, and exactly the colour of a three-days-old Congo baby. Remembering the embalmed head, at first I almost thought that this black mannequin was a real baby preserved in some similar manner. But seeing that it was not at all limber, and that it glistened a good deal like polished ebony, I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol, which indeed it proved to be. For now the savage goes up to the empty fireplace, and, removing the papered fireboard, sets up this little hunchbacked image like a ten-pin between the andirons, the chimney jams and all the bricks inside were very sooty, so that I thought this fireplace made a very appropriate little shrine or chapel for his Congo idol. I now screwed my eyes hard toward the half-hidden image, feeling but ill at ease, meantime, to see what was next to follow. First he takes about a double handful of shavings out of his grego pocket, and places them carefully before the idol. Then, laying a bit of ship biscuit on top and applying the flame from the lamp, he kindled the shavings into a sacrificial blaze. Presently, after many hasty snatches into the fire, and still hastier withdrawals of his fingers, whereby he seemed to be scorching them badly, he at last succeeded in drawing out the biscuit, then blowing off the heat and ashes a little, he made a polite offer of it to the little negro. But the little devil did not seem to fancy such dry sort of fare at all. He never moved his lips. All these strange antics were accompanied by still stranger guttural noises from the devotee, who seemed to be praying in a sing-song, or else singing some pagan psalmody or other, during which his face twitched about in the most unnatural manner. At last, extinguishing the fire, he took his idol up very unceremoniously, and bagged it again in his grego pocket as carelessly as if he were a sportsman bagging a dead woodcock. All these queer proceedings increased my uncomfortableness, and seeing him now exhibiting strong symptoms of concluding his business operations and jumping into bed with me, I thought it was high time, now or never, before the light was put out, to break the spell in which I had so long been bound. 
but the interval I spent in deliberating what to say was a fatal one. Taking his tomahawk from the table, he examined the head of it for an instant, and then holding it to the light, with his mouth at the handle, he puffed out great clouds of tobacco smoke. The next moment the light was extinguished, and this wild cannibal, tomahawk between his teeth, sprang into bed with me. I sang out, I could not help it now, and giving a sudden grunt of astonishment, he began feeling me. Stammering out something, I knew not what, I rolled away from him against the wall, and then conjured him, whoever or whatever he might be, to keep quiet, and let me get up and light the lamp again. But his guttural responses satisfied me at once that he but ill comprehended my meaning. "'Who a devil you?' he said at last. "'You no speak ye, damn me, I kill ye!' And so saying, the lighted tomahawk began flourishing about me in the dark. "'Landlord, for God's sake, Peter Coffin!' shouted I. "'Landlord, watch! Coffin! Angel, save me!' "'Speak ye! Tell ye me who ye be, or damn me, I kill ye!' again growled the cannibal, while his horrid flourishings of the tomahawk scattered the hot tobacco ashes about me till I thought my linen would get on fire. But, thank heaven, at that moment the landlord came into the room, light in hand, and leaping from the bed I ran up to him. "'Don't be afraid now,' said he, grinning again. "'Queequeg here wouldn't harm a hair of your head.' "'Stop your grinning!' shouted I. "'And why didn't you tell me that that infernal harpooner was a cannibal?' "'I thought you'd know it. "'Didn't I tell you he was a-peddling heads around town? "'But turn flukes again and go to sleep. "'Queequeg, look here. "'You sabby me, I sabby you. "'This man sleepy you. "'You sabby?' "'Me sabby plenty.' grunted Queequeg, puffing away at his pipe and sitting up in bed. "'You get ye in,' he added, motioning to me with his tomahawk, and throwing the clothes to one side. He really did this in not only a civil, but really a kind and charitable way. I stood looking at him a moment. For all his tattooings he was on the whole a clean, comely-looking cannibal. "'What's all this fuss I have been making about?' thought I to myself." The man's a human being, just as I am. He has as much reason to fear me as I have to be afraid of him. Better sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Landlord, said I, tell him to stash his tomahawk there, or a pipe, or whatever you call it. Tell him to stop smoking, in short, and I will turn in with him. But I don't fancy having a man smoking in bed with me. It's dangerous. Besides, I ain't insured. This being told to Queequeg, he at once complied, and again politely motioned me to get into bed, rolling over to one side as much to say, I won't touch a leg of you. Good night, landlord, said I. You may go. I turned in, and never slept better in my life. End of chapter 3 Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. The counterpane was of patchwork, full of odd little party-colored squares and triangles, and this arm of his, tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure, no two parts of which were of one precise shade, owing, I suppose, to his keeping his arm at sea unmethodically in sun and shade, his shirt-sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times, this same arm of his, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same patchwork quilt. Indeed, partly lying on it as the arm did when I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt they so blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell that Queequeg was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain them. When I was a child, I well remember a somewhat similar circumstance that befell me. Whether it was a reality or a dream, I never could entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other. I think it was trying to crawl up the chimney, as I had seen a little sweep do a few days previous. And my stepmother, who somehow or other was all the time whipping me, or sending me to bed supperless, my mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st June, the longest day of the year in our hemisphere. 
I felt dreadfully. But there was no help for it, so upstairs I went to my little room in the third floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time, and with a bitter sigh got between the sheets. I lay there dismally calculating that sixteen entire hours must elapse before I could hope for a resurrection. Sixteen hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was so light, too, the sun shining in at the window, and a great rattling of coaches in the streets, and the sound of gay voices all over the house. I felt worse and worse. At last I got up, dressed, and, softly going down in my stocking feet, sought out my stepmother, and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseeching her as a particular favor to give me a good slippering for my misbehavior, anything indeed but condemning me to lie abed for such an endurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of stepmothers, and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there, broad awake, feeling a great deal worse than I have ever done since, even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze, and slowly waking from it, half steeped in dreams, I opened my eyes, and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in outer darkness. Instantly I felt a shock running through all my frame. Nothing was to be seen, and nothing was to be heard. But a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane, and the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom to which the hand belonged seemed closely seated by my bedside. For what seemed ages piled on ages, I lay there, frozen with the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand, yet ever thinking that if I could but stir it one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this consciousness at last glided away from me, but waking in the morning I shudderingly remembered it all, and for days and weeks and months afterwards I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour I often puzzle myself with it. Now take away the awful fear, and my sensations at feeling the supernatural hand in mine were very similar in their strangeness to those which I experienced on waking up and seeing Queequeg's pagan arm thrown round me. But at length all the past night's events soberly recurred, one by one, in fixed reality, and then I lay only alive to the comical predicament. For though I tried to move his arm, unlock his bridegroom clasp, yet, sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly, as though naught but death should part us twain. I now strove to rouse him. Queequeg! But his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were in a horse collar, and suddenly felt a slight scratch. Throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk, sleeping by the savage's side, as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. A pretty pickle, truly, thought I. A bed here in a strange house in broad day with a cannibal and a tomahawk. Queequeg! In the name of goodness, Queequeg, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling and loud and incessant expostulations upon the unbecomingness of his hugging a fellow male in that matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew back his arm, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog just from the water, and sat up in bed, stiff as a pike staff, looking at me, and rubbing his eyes as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there though a dim consciousness of knowing something about me seemed slowly dawning over him. Meanwhile I lay quietly eyeing him, having no serious misgivings now, and bent upon narrowly observing so curious a creature. When, at last, his mind seemed made up touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact, he jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds, gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first, and then leave me to dress afterward, leaving the whole apartment to myself. Thinks I, Queequeg, under the circumstances this is a very civilized overture. But the truth is, these savages have an innate sense of delicacy, say what you will. It is marvelous how essentially polite they are. 
I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg, because he treated me with so much civility and consideration while I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed and watching all of his toilet motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg you don't see every day. He and his ways were well worth unusual regarding. He commenced dressing at top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then, still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. What under the heavens he did it for I cannot tell, but his next movement was to crush himself, boots in hand and hat on, under the bed, when, from sundry violent gaspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But Queequeg, do you see, was a creature in the transition stage, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manners. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. If he had not been a small degree civilized, he probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all. But then, if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last he emerged, with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes, and began creaking and limping about the room, as if not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp, wrinkled cowhide ones, probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go off of a bitter cold morning. Seeing now that there were no curtains to the window, and that the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room, and observing more and more the indecorous figure that Queequeg made, staving about with little else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get into his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied, and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning any Christian would have washed his face, but Queequeg, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablutions to his chest, arms, and hands. He then donned his waistcoat, and, taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it into water and commenced lathering his face. I was washing to see where he kept his razor, and, lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed-corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and, striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping, or rather harpooning, of his cheeks. Thinks I, Queequeg, this is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards I wondered less at this operation when I came to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made, and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in his great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. CHAPTER V. BREAKFAST I quickly followed suit, and descending into the bar-room accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly. I cherished no malice toward him, though he had been skylarking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing, and rather too scarce a good thing, the more's the pity. So if any one man in his own proper person affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man than you perhaps think for. The bar-room was now full of the boarders who had been dropping in the night previous, and whom I had not as yet had a good look at. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates, and second mates, and third mates, and sea carpenters, and sea coopers, and sea blacksmiths, and harpooners, and ship keepers, a brown and brawny company with bosky beards, an unshorn shaggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. You could pretty plainly tell how long each one had been ashore. This young fellow's healthy cheek is like a sun-toasted pear in hue and would seem to smell almost as musky. He can not have been three days landed from his Indian voyage. That man next him looks a few shades lighter. 
you might say a touch of satin wood is in him. In the complexion of a third, still lingers a tropic tawn, but slightly bleached withal. He, doubtless, has tarried whole weeks ashore. But who could show a cheek like Queequeg, which, barred with various tints, seemed, like the Andes' western slope, to show forth in one array contrasting climates, zone by zone. "'Grub, ho!' now cried the landlord, flinging open a door, and in we went to breakfast. They say that men who have seen the world thereby become quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed in company. Not always, though. Ledyard, the great New England traveller, and Mungo Park, the Scotch one, of all men they possess the least assurance in the parlour. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs, as Ledyard did, or the taking of a long solitary walk on an empty stomach in the negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performances, this kind of travel, I say, may not be the very best mode of attaining a high social polish. Still, for the most part, that sort of thing is to be had anywhere. These reflections just here are occasioned by the circumstance that after we were all seated at the table, and I was preparing to hear some good stories about whaling, to my no small surprise nearly every man maintained a profound silence. And not only that, but they looked embarrassed. Yes, here were a set of sea-dogs, many of whom, without the slightest bashfulness, had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking, and yet here they sat at a social breakfast-table, all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes, looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen. But as for Queequeg, why Queequeg sat there among them, at the head of the table, too, it so chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure, I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him, and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it to the imminent jeopardy of many heads, and grappling the beefsteaks toward him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and every one knows that in most people's estimation, to do anything coolly is to do it genteelly. We will not speak of all Queequeg's peculiarities here, how he eschewed coffee and hot rolls, and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare, Enough that when breakfast was over he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, and was sitting there quietly digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on when I sallied out for a stroll. CHAPTER Six, THE STREET If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Lascars and Malays, and at Bombay, in the Apollo Green, live Yankees have often scared the natives. But New Bedford beats all Water Street in Wapping. In these last-mentioned haunts you see only sailors, but in New Bedford actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh. It makes a stranger stare." But besides the Fijians, Tonga de Boars, Aramangoans, Panangians, and Brigians, and besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft which, unheeded, reel about the streets, you will see other sights still more curious, certainly more comical. There weekly arrive in this town scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshiremen, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. They are mostly young, of stalwart frames, fellows who have felled forests and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale-lance. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. 
In some things you would think them but a few hours old. Look there, that chap strutting round the corner. He wears a beaver hat and swallow-tailed coat, girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife. Here comes another with a southwester and a bombazine cloak. No town-bred dandy will compare with a country-bred one. I mean a downright bumpkin dandy. A fellow that, in the dog days, will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Now, when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation and joins the great whale-fishery, you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport. In bespeaking his sea outfit, he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats, straps to his canvas trousers. Ah, poor hayseed, how bitterly will burst those straps in the first howling gale when thou art driven, straps, button, and all, down the throat of the tempest. But think not that this famous town has only harpooners, cannibals, and bumpkins to show her visitors. Not at all. Still New Bedford is a queer place. Had it not been for us whalemen, that tract of land would this day perhaps have been in as howling condition as the coast of Labrador. As it is, parts of her back country are enough to frighten one, they look so bony. The town itself is perhaps the dearest place to live in in all New England. It is a land of oil, true enough, but not like Canaan, a land also of corn and wine. The streets do not run with milk, nor in the springtime do they pave them with fresh eggs. Yet in spite of this, nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent, than in New Bedford. Whence came they? How planted upon this once scraggy scoria of a country? Go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round yonder lofty mansion, and your question will be answered. Yes, all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Ocean. One and all they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. Can Herr Alexander perform a feat like that? In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for, the, for dowers to their daughters, and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises apiece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wedding, for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house, and every night recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti candles. In summer time, the town is sweet to see, full of fine maples, long avenues of green and gold. And in August, high in air, the beautiful and bountiful horse-chestnuts, candelabra-wise, proffer the passer-by their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms. So omnipotent is art, which, in many a district of New Bedford, has superinduced bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day. And the women of New Bedford, they bloom like their own red roses. But roses only bloom in summer, whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens. Elsewhere match that bloom of theirs ye cannot, save in Salem, where, they tell me, the young girls breathe such musk, their sailor sweethearts smell them miles off shore, as though they were drawing nigh the odorous Moluccas instead of the Puritanic sands. CHAPTER Seven, THE CHAPEL in this same New Bedford there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific who fail to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sallied out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear, sunny cold to driving sleet and mist. Wrapping myself in my shaggy jacket of the cloth called bearskin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned, only broken at times by the shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshipper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other, as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived, and there these silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing several marble tablets with black borders masoned into the walls on either side of the pulpit. Three of them ran something like the following, but I do not pretend to quote. 
sacred to the memory of john talbot who at the age of eighteen was lost overboard near the isle of desolation off patagonia november first eighteen thirty six this tablet is erected to his memory by his sister sacred to the memory of robert long willis ellery nathan coleman walter canny seth macy and samuel gleig forming one of the boat's crews of the ship eliza who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the pacific december thirty first eighteen thirty nine this marble is here placed by their surviving shipmates sacred to the memory of the late captain ezekiel hardy who in the bows of his boat was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of japan august third eighteen thirty three this tablet is erected to his memory by his widow shaking off the sleet from my ice-glazed hat and jacket i seated myself near the door and turning sideways was surprised to see queequeg near me affected by the solemnity of the scene there was a wondering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance this savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance because he was the only one who could not read and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation i knew not but so many are the unrecorded accidents in the fishery and so plainly did several women present wear the countenance if not the trappings of some unceasing grief that i feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hearts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh o oh, ye whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass who standing among flowers can say here here lies my beloved you know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these what bitter blanks in those black-bordered marbles which cover no ashes what despair in those immovable inscriptions what deadly voids and unbidden infidelities in the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave as well might those tablets stand in the cave of elephanta as here in what census of living creatures the dead of mankind are included why it is that a universal proverb says of them that they tell no tales though containing more secrets than the good one sands how it is that to his name who yesterday departed for the other world we prefix so significant and infidel a word and yet do not thus entitle him if he but embarks for the remotest indies of this living earth why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals in what eternal unstirring paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique adam who died sixty round centuries ago how it is that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss why all the living so strive to hush all the dead wherefore but the rumour of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city all these things are not without their meanings but faith like a jackal feeds among the tombs and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope it needs scarcely be told with what feelings on the eve of a nantucket voyage i regarded those marble tablets and by the murky light of that darkened doleful day read the fate of the whaleman who had gone before me yes ishmael the same fate may be thine but somehow i grew merry again delightful inducements to embark fine chance for promotion it seems ay a stove-boat will make me an immortal by brevet yes there is death in this business of whaling a speechlessly quick chaotic bundling of a man into eternity but what then methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance methinks that in looking at things spiritual we are too much like oysters observing the sun through the water and thinking that thick water the thinnest of air methinks my body is but the lees of my better being in fact take my body who will take it i say it is not me 
and therefore three cheers for Nantucket, and come a stove boat and stove body when they will, for stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. End of chapters four through seven. I had not been seated very long ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered. Immediately, as the storm-pelted door flew back upon admitting him, a quick, regardful eyeing of him by all of the congregation sufficiently attested that this fine old man was the chaplain. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalemen, among whom he was a very great favorite. He had been a sailor and a harpooner in his youth, but for many years past had dedicated his life to the ministry. At the time I now write of, Father Mapple was in the hardy winter of a healthy old age, that sort of old age which seems merging into a second flowering youth, for among all the fissures of his wrinkles there shone certain mild gleams of a newly developing bloom, the spring verdure peeping forth even beneath February's snow. No one, having previously heard his history, could for the first time behold Father Mapple without the utmost interest, because there were certain engrafted clerical peculiarities about him, imputable to that adventurous maritime life he had led. When he entered, I observed that he carried no umbrella, and certainly had not come in his carriage, for his tarpaulin hat ran down with melting sleet, and his great pilot-cloth jacket seemed almost to drag him to the floor with the weight of the water it had absorbed. However, hat and coat and overshoes were one by one removed, and hung up in a little space in an adjacent corner, when, arrayed in a decent suit, he quietly approached the pulpit. Like most old-fashioned pulpits, it was a very lofty one, and since a regular stairs to such a height would, by its long angle with the floor, seriously contract the already small area of the chapel, the architect, it seemed, had acted upon the hint of Father Mapple, and finished the pulpit without a stairs, substituting a perpendicular side ladder, like those used in mounting a ship from a boat at sea. The wife of a whaling captain had provided the chapel with a handsome pair of red-worsted man-ropes for this ladder, which, being itself nicely headed and stained with a mahogany color, the whole contrivance, considering what manner of chapel it was, seemed by no means in bad taste. Halting for an instant at the foot of the ladder, and with both hands grasping the ornamental knobs of the man-ropes, Father Mapple cast a look upwards, and then, with a truly sailor-like but still reverential dexterity, hand over hand, mounted the steps as if ascending the main top of his vessel. The perpendicular parts of this side ladder, as is usually the case with swinging ones, were of cloth-covered rope. Only the rounds were of wood, so that at every step there was a joint. At my first glimpse of the pulpit it had not escaped me that however convenient for a ship these joints in the present instance seemed unnecessary, for I was not prepared to see Father Mapple, after gaining the height, slowly turn round, and stooping over the pulpit, deliberately drag up the ladder step by step, till the hole was deposited within, leaving him impregnable in his little Quebec. I pondered some time without fully comprehending the reason for this. Father Mapple enjoyed such a wide reputation for sincerity and sanctity that I could not suspect him of courting notoriety by any mere tricks of the stage. No, thought I, there must be some sober reason for this thing. Furthermore, it must symbolize something unseen. Can it be, then, that by that act of physical isolation, he signifies his spiritual withdrawal for the time from all outward worldly ties and connections? Yes, for, replenished with the meat and wine of the word, to the faithful man of God this pulpit, I see, is a self-containing stronghold, a lofty Ehrenbreitstein with a perennial well of water within the walls. But the side ladder was not the only strange feature of the place borrowed from the chaplain's former seafarings, between the marble cenotaphs on either hand of the pulpit, the wall which formed its back was adorned with a large painting representing a gallant ship beating against a terrible storm off a lee coast of black rocks and snowy breakers. 
but high above the flying scud and dark rolling clouds there floated a little isle of sunlight, from which beamed forth an angel's face, and this bright face shed a distinct spot of radiance upon the ship's tossed deck, something like that silver plate now inserted into the victory's plank where Nelson fell. Ah, noble ship, the angel seemed to say, beat on, beat on, thou noble ship, and bear a hearty helm, for lo, the sun is breaking through, the clouds are rolling off, serenest azure is at hand. Nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of the same sea taste that had achieved the latter in the picture. Its panelled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested on a projecting piece of scroll-work fashioned after a ship's fiddle-headed beak. What could be more full of meaning? For the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first descried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is, the god of breezes, fair or foul, is first invoked for favourable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. CHAPTER Nine, THE SERMON Father Mapple rose, and in a mild voice of unassuming authority, ordered the scattered people to condense. "'Starboard gangway there, side away to larboard!' "'Larboard gangway to starboard. Midships! Midships!' There was a low rumbling of heavy sea-boots among the benches, and a still slighter shuffling of women's shoes, and all was quiet again, and every eye on the preacher. He paused a little, then kneeling in the pulpit's bows, folded his large brown hands across his chest, uplifted his closed eyes, and offered a prayer so deeply devout that he seemed kneeling and praying at the bottom of the sea. This ended in prolonged solemn tones like the continual tolling of a bell in a ship that is foundering at sea in a fog. In such tones he commenced reading the following hymn, but changing his manner towards the concluding stanzas burst forth with appealing exultation and joy. The ribs and terrors of the whale arched over me in dismal gloom, while all God's sunlit waves rolled by and lift me deepening down to doom. I saw the opening maw of hell with endless pains and sorrows there, which none but they that feel can tell. Oh, I was plunging to despair. In black distress I called my God when I could scarce believe him mine. He bowed his ear to my complaints, no more the whale did me confine. With speed he flew to my relief, as on a radiant dolphin born, awful yet bright as lightning shone, the face of my deliverer God. My song forever shall record that terrible, that joyful hour. I give the glory to my God, his all the mercy and the power. Nearly all joined in singing this hymn, which swelled high above the howling of the storm. A brief pause ensued. The preacher slowly turned over the leaves of the Bible, and at last, folding his hand down on the proper page, said, "'Beloved shipmates, clinch the last verse of the first chapter of Jonah. And God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Shipmates, this book, containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the Scriptures.' Yet what depths of the soul does Jonah's deep sea-line sound? What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet! What a noble thing is that canticle in the fish's belly! How billow-like and boisterously grand! We feel the flood surging over us, we sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is about us. But what is the lesson that this book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson, a lesson to us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. As sinful men, it is a lesson to us all, because it is the story of the sin, hard-heartedness, suddenly awakened fears, the swift punishment, repentance, prayers, and finally the deliverance and joy of Jonah. As with all sinners among men, the sin of this son of Amittai was in his willful disobedience to the command of God, never mind now what that command was or how conveyed. 
which he found a hard command. But all things that God would have us do are hard for us to do. Remember that. And hence he oftener commands us than endeavors to persuade. And if we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. With this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. He thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. He skulks about the wharves of Joppa, and seeks a ship that's bound for Tarshish. There lurks perhaps a hitherto unheeded meaning here. By all accounts Tarshish could have been no other city than the modern Cadiz. That's the opinion of learned men. And where is Cadiz, shipmates? Cadiz is in Spain, as far by water from Joppa as Jonah could possibly have sailed in those ancient days when the Atlantic was an almost unknown sea, because Joppa, the modern Jaffa, shipmates, is on the most easterly coast of the Mediterranean, the Syrian, and Tarshish or Cadiz more than two thousand miles to the westward from that, just outside the Straits of Gibraltar. See ye not then, shipmates, that Jonah sought to flee world-wide from God? Miserable man! Oh, most contemptible, and worthy of all scorn! with slouched hat and guilty eyes, skulking from his god, prowling among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas. So disordered, self-condemning in his look, that had there been policemen in those days, Jonah, on the mere suspicion of something wrong, had been arrested ere he touched a deck. How plainly he's a fugitive! No baggage, not a hat-box, valise, or carpet-bag— no friends accompany him to the wharf with their adieus. At last, after much dodging search, he finds the Tarshi ship receiving the last items of her cargo, and as he steps on board to see its captain in the cabin, all the sailors, for the moment, desist from hoisting in the goods to mark the stranger's evil eye. Jonah sees this, but in vain he tries to look all ease and confidence, in vain essays his wretched smile. Strong intuitions of the men assure the mariners he can be no innocent. In their gamesome but still serious way, one whispers to the other, Jack, he's robbed a widow, or Joe, do you mark him? He's a bigamist, or Harry, lad, I guess he's the adulterer that broke jail in old Gomorrah, or be like one of the missing murderers from Sodom. Another runs to read the bill that's stuck against the spile upon the wharf to which the ship is moored, offering five hundred gold coins for the apprehension of a parricide, and containing a description of his person. He reads and looks from Jonah to the bill, while all his sympathetic shipmates now crowd round Jonah, prepared to lay their hands upon him. Frightened Jonah trembles, and summoning all his boldness to his face only looks so much the more a coward." He will not confess himself suspected, but that itself is strong suspicion. So he makes the best of it, and when the sailors find him not to be the man that is advertised, they let him pass, and he descends into the cabin. "'Who's there?' cries the captain at his busy desk, hurriedly making out his papers for the customs. "'Who's there?' Oh, how that harmless question mangles Jonah! For the instant he almost turns to flee again, but he rallies." I seek a passage in this ship to Tarshish. How soon sail ye, sir? Thus far the busy captain had not looked up to Jonah, though the man now stands before him, but no sooner does he hear that hollow voice than he darts a scrutinizing glance. We sail with the next coming tide, at last he slowly answered, still intently eyeing him. No sooner, sir. Soon enough for any honest man that goes a passenger. Ha! Jonah, that's another stab. But he swiftly calls away the captain from the scent. I'll sail with you, he says. The passage money, how much is that? I'll pay now. For it is particularly written, shipmates, as if it were a thing not to be overlooked in this history, that he paid the fare thereof ere the craft did sail. And taken with the context, this is full of meaning. Now, Jonah's captain, shipmates, 
was one whose discernment detects crime in any, but whose cupidity exposes it only in the penniless. In this world, shipmates, sin that pays its way can travel freely, and without a passport, whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. So Jonah's captain prepares to test the length of Jonah's purse, ere he judge him openly. He charges him thrice the usual sum, and it's assented to. Then the captain knows that Jonah is a fugitive, but at the same time resolves to help a flight that paves its rear with gold. Yet, when Jonah fairly takes out his purse, prudent suspicion still molests the captain. He rings every coin to find a counterfeit. Not a forger, anyway, he mutters, and Jonah is put down for his passage. Point out my stateroom, sir, says Jonah now. I'm travel-weary. I need sleep. Thou look'st like it, says the captain. There's thy room. Jonah enters, and would lock the door, but the lock contains no key. Hearing him foolishly fumbling there, the captain laughs slowly to himself, and mutters something about the doors of convict cells being never allowed to be locked within. All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth, and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then, in that contracted hole, sunk too beneath the ship's water-line, Jonah feels the heralding presentiment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels' wards. Screwed at its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slightly oscillates in Jonah's room, and the ship heeling over towards the wharf with the weight of the last bales received, the lamp, flame, and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room, though in truth infallibly straight itself, it but made obvious the false lying levels among which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah, as lying in his berth his tormented eyes roll round the place, and this thus far successful fugitive finds no refuge for his restless glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more appalls him. The floor, the ceiling, and the side are all awry. Oh, so my conscience hangs in me, he groans, straight upward so it burns, but the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. Like one who, after a night of drunken revelry, hies to his bed, still reeling, but with conscience yet pricking him, as the plungings of the Roman racehorse but so much more strike his steel tags into him, as one who in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be past, and at last amid the whirl of woe he feels a deep stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death, for conscience is the wound, and there's naught to stanch it. So, after sore wrestlings in his birth, Jonah's prodigy of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep. And now the time of tide has come, the ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf the uncheered ship for Tarshish, all careening, glides to sea. That ship, my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. But the sea rebels. He will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes on. The ship is like to break. But now, when the boatswain calls all hands to lighten her, when boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard, when the wind is shrieking and the men are yelling, and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over Jonah's head, in all this raging tumult, Jonah sleeps his hideous sleep. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers, and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale, which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Ay, shipmates, Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, a berth in the cabin as I have taken it, and was fast asleep. But the frightened master comes to him, and shrieks in his dead ear, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise? Startled from his lethargy by that direful cry, Jonah staggers to his feet, and stumbling to the deck, grasps a shroud to look out upon the sea. But at that moment he is sprung upon by a panther billow leaping over the bulwarks. 
Wave after wave thus leaps onto the ship, and finding no speedy vent runs roaring fore and aft, till the mariners come nigh to drowning while yet afloat. And ever, as the white moon shows her affrighted face from the steep gullies in the blackness overhead, aghast Jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward, but soon beat downward again towards the tormented deep. Terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul. In all his cringing attitudes the god-fugitive is now too plainly known. The sailors mark him. More and more certain grow their suspicions of him, and at last fully to test the truth, by referring the whole matter to high heaven they fall to casting lots, to see for whose cause this great tempest was upon him. The lot is Jonah's. That discovered, then how furiously they mob him with their questions. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? Thy country? What people? But mark now, shipmates, the behavior of poor Jonah. The eager mariners but ask him who he is and where from, whereas they not only receive an answer to those questions, but likewise another answer to a question not put by them, but the unsolicited answer is forced from Jonah by the hard hand of God that is upon him. I am a Hebrew, he cries, and then, I fear the Lord God of heaven who hath made the sea and the dry land. Fear him, O Jonah. Aye, well mightst thou fear the Lord God, then— Straight away he now goes on to make a full confession, whereupon the mariners became more and more appalled, but still are pitiful. For when Jonah, not yet supplicating God for mercy, since he but too well knew the darkness of his deserts, when wretched Jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea, for he knew that it was for his sake this great tempest was upon them, they mercifully turn from him and seek by other means to save the ship. But all in vain. The indignant gale howls louder, and then, with one hand raised invokingly to God, with the other they not unreluctantly lay hold of Jonah. And now behold Jonah taken up as an anchor and dropped into the sea, when instantly an oily calmness floats out from the east, and the sea is still as Jonah carries down the gale with him, leaving smooth water behind. He goes down in a whirling heart of such a masterless commotion that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops seething into the yawning jaws awaiting him, and the whale shoots too all his ivory teeth like so many white bolts upon his prison. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish's belly. But observe his prayer and learn a weighty lesson. For sinful as he is, Jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance. He feels that his dreadful punishment is just. He leaves all his deliverance to God, contenting himself with this, that spite of all his pains and pangs he will still look towards his holy temple. And here, shipmates, is true and faithful repentance, not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. And how pleasing to God was this conduct in Jonah is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale. Shipmates, I do not place Jonah before you to be copied for his sin, but I do place him before you as a model for repentance. Sin not, but if you do, take heed to repent of it like Jonah. While he was speaking these words, the howling of the shrieking, slanting storm without seemed to add new power to the preacher, who, when describing Jonah's sea storm, seemed tossed by a storm himself, his deep chest heaved as with a groundswell, his tossed arms seemed the warring elements at work, and the thunders that rolled away from off his swarthy brow, and the light leaping from his eye, made all his simple hearers look on him with a quick fear that was strange to them. There now came a lull in his look, as he silently turned over the leaves of the book once more, and at last, standing motionless, with closed eyes, for the moment seemed communing with God and himself. But again he leaned towards the people, and bowing his head lowly with an aspect of the deepest yet manliest humility, he spake these words. Shipmates, God has laid but one hand upon you. Both his hands press upon me. I have read ye by what murky light may be mine the lesson that Jonah teaches to all sinners, and therefore to you, and still more to me, for I am a greater sinner than you. 
and now how gladly would I come down from this masthead and sit on the hatches there where you sit, and listen as you listen, while some one of you reads me that other and more awful lesson which Jonah teaches to me as a pilot of the living God. How, being anointed pilot, prophet, or speaker of true things, and bidden by the Lord to sound those unwelcome truths in the ears of a wicked Nineveh, Jonah, appalled at the hostility he should raise, fled from his mission, and sought to escape his duty and his God by taking ship at Joppa. But God is everywhere, Tarshish he never reached. As we have seen, God came upon him in the whale, and swallowed him down to the living gulfs of doom, and with swift slantings tore him along into the midst of the seas, where the eddying depths sucked him ten thousand fathoms down, and the weeds were wrapped about his head, and all the watery world of woe bowled over him. Yet even then, beyond the reach of any plummet, out of the belly of hell, when the whale grounded upon the ocean's utmost bones, even then God heard the engulfed repenting prophet when he cried. Then God spake unto the fish, and from the shuddering cold and blackness of the sea the whale came breaching up towards the warm and pleasant sun, and all the delights of air and earth, and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land, when the word of the Lord came a second time. And Jonah, bruised and beaten, his ears like two seashells, still multitudinously murmuring of the ocean, Jonah did the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? To preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This, shipmates, is the other lesson, and woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him whom this world charms from gospel duty. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true, even though to be false were salvation. Yea, woe to him who, as the great pilot Paul has it, while preaching to others is himself a castaway. He dropped and fell away from himself for a moment, then, lifting his face to them again, showed a deep joy in his eyes as he cried out with a heavenly enthusiasm, But, oh, shipmates, on the starboard hand of every woe there is a sure delight, and higher the top of that delight than the bottom of the woe is deep. Is not the main truck higher than the kelson is low? Delight is to him, a far, far upward and inward delight, who against the proud gods and commodores of this earth ever stands forth his own inexorable self. Delight is to him whose strong arms yet support him, when the ship of this base, treacherous world has gone down beneath him. Delight it is to him who gives no quarter in the truth, and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. Delight, top-gallant delight, is to him who acknowledges no law or lord but the Lord his God, and is only a patriot to heaven. Delight is to him whom all the waves of the billows of the seas and the boisterous mob can never shake from this sure keel of the ages. An eternal delight and deliciousness will be his, who, coming to lay him down, can say with his final breath, O oh, Father, chiefly known to me by thy rod, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine, more than to be this world's or mine own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee, for what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? He said no more, but slowly waving a benediction, covered his face with his hands, and so remained kneeling till all the people had departed, and he was left alone in the place. End of chapters 8 and 9